Evening, I'm Darius Hajan Jaffe. Tonight we're going to be discussing Nazir Mazar. Uh, since three of us actually have total Nazir Mazar looks on, uh, or, or a lot of Nazir Mazar, we're obviously a little bit biased. So this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, and our panel are... Uh, Soki Mack, I'm a freelance uh, creative director and stylist. Uh, Kirtley Thomas, I'm a menswear consultant. Gary Aspden, I'm a brand consultant working predominantly with Adidas. Um, I'm Aaron Fern, a store manager of Machine A in London. I'm Katie Barron, I'm an author and journalist. So fantastic. Uh, w one of the reasons why we have a store manager is because this guy sells more Nazir Mazar than anybody else on earth. Um, <laughs> so we thought that would make a good addition to the panel. Um, so one of the things we were talking about uh, before the camera started rolling um, was the idea of place in fashion and how much of fashion is sold through the fantasy of space and joining a, a, a place. And um, uh, most of the panels seem to agree that Nazir Mazar had uh, crystallised a, a whole uh, new sense of what London is. Um, and maybe quite excitingly for JG Ballard, not what Dalston is, but what uh, the outer suburbs are, somewhere like Leighton, where Nazir Mazar is from. So, guys, take it away. Who's <laughs> <laughs> starting? I I'll think start. Oh, no, you start. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, what Naz is doing at the moment is picking from, as you said, his culture of what he's known and what he's seen around him in Leighton. And he's not only referencing that, but he's referencing TV culture. He's referencing, as you said before, he's referencing video games and he's referencing almost a subculture that people know about, but they don't really dig deep enough into. So things like the tracksuit, where it's kind of taken a, for granted as kind of a low level piece of clothing, he's kind of made that a sense of couture. He's kind of adding and using all these kind of quite low level materials, I'd probably say as well, with like ribbing and things. It's quite honest, isn't it? I mean, I think, you know, he always says, with all the interviews I've had with him, um, that for him it's very much his sort of DIY aesthetic, it's quite sort of stream of consciousness in a way, yep. that rather than, you know, when people kind of over-intellectualise things and put a story on, not, not that there's anything wrong with kind of having a story and, and you know, being cerebral or conceptual about mm. these things, but to him it almost feels like it's very much by osmosis, he's literally picking up what he sees around him and therefore yep. the final output you have to assume is quite honest and it is a reflection of what he's seeing going on around him and I think for sort of, especially for younger kind of consumers or a younger audience, that's quite exciting because you've got something to aspire to, but you're also probably seeing something of the world around you, which is pretty exciting in, in fashion, I think, especially you're, for London. You're absolutely mm. right. When I was in the studio yesterday, he said, you know, I don't understand designers who talk about references and influences. How can they only have two? That's weird. He had six pictures on the wall, which were sort of, of uh, Hollywood versions of Tudor, and so one of his assistants walked in and said, what shall I make this bag out of? You know, uh, less than 24 hours before the show. <laughs> and he's like, uh, make it out of this. And he, he absolutely does exactly what you've said. He just doesn't intellectualize it. He's just putting it together out of the ether, out of his ether that he's gathered around him. But um, let's go back to, sorry, let's go back to, I was just backing you up. But let's carry on on that place theme because Aaron and Gary, you were having quite an intense. Aaron, sorry, you guys were having quite an intense conversation about that. Yeah, well, we were just talking about the whole basis of our taste and the the, the lack of understanding of sportswear in fashion in certain sections of fashion, and, and and Aaron was just talking a little bit about his background and you know I think people's environments definitely influence their taste and um, you know his reference points are very similar reference points to my own but in a different part of the country for a different generation I guess. Yeah I mean it's quite interesting isn't it because I mean you know while we're in London we're looking at the London shows specifically I mean I'm not expecting that we're going to see anything like we're going to see in a minute you know in Paris or Milan and I think that's it's interesting you know is, is the sort of the streetwear thing is that a really British thing is that actually you know something to be quite proud of in a way I mean thinking of you know I mean whether yeah wherever we're from I mean I'm from Brighton we're talking you know I'm not sure where you're from Gary but we're you know whether it's 
near Blackburn. Yeah, and you know, all, again, it's the sort of suburban thing, all our sort of suburban references. I mean, um, I haven't actually seen the Christopher Shannon show, but I'm really excited about seeing that again for the same reasons. When I interviewed him, you know, a couple of years ago, and he was talking about how he wanted to do something which touched on not just that rarefied world of menswear fashion and stuff where it was kind of so, not obscure exactly, but almost so, you know, so sort of hope that you're, you know, you can't get in touch with it, you can't get any kind of access points, you can't hook it head on a hook if you're just a normal guy. And I find this exciting because, you know, with people like Christopher and Azir, it's, it's exciting and it's still to totally imaginative, but there is some kind of underlying core thing there that makes you feel like it's kind of part of your culture. And that's, you know, pretty exciting for all of us. Brighton, I mean, Brighton's just the same bits of bits of it. Yeah, I think with Christopher Shannon, you can almost get a sense of his Liverpool roots coming through in what he does. You know, he's completely kind of reinvented those roots. Uh, and I think it's the same with this guy. You know, for, for me, it, you know, you were talking about um, him defining London in a way it, you could almost say London defines him because it, it is very London centric what he's doing um, you know all, a lot of his references are clearly coming from what's going on around him and you know that the, there's definitely um, a huge difference in the reference points between the north of the UK and London. London's like a kind of almost like a separate state. A little microcosm in its own mm. way, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's a particularly yeah. in men's fashion. Particularly in men's fashion. I think it's. I think as well. Uh, you know, it's exciting the the link there to. We well, you know like his uh, his show music for today. He told me yesterday is a uh, Darky Freaker, who's a amazing. yeah an amazing yeah. grime producer. Uh, producer pretty mm. much, and you know. <coughs> Well, so I think kind of what's interesting there is that uh, a couple of American hip hop guys have picked up on him, and that would never have happened ten years ago. There's no way Americans would ever admit to being influenced by British music. You know, there's always that thing that Timberland was influenced by drum and bass, but he'd never admit it. Admit it. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, and that's really interesting that our culture is getting out there. You know, and I think and I think that that underground culture and that he's relating to that. And you know he's also, I think you can see video game references in in aesthetically, and that feels very twenty first century. I guess it's because of you know the American culture. There's so much stuff in it. It becomes so big so quickly. Again, it's another sort of geographical thing in a way that anything there becomes this sort of huge mainstream thing that actually Britain's a really good place to look look to still for that slightly more experimental underground, you know, the underdog. Um, you know, approach in a way. I think something that he does is, which is quite interesting, is that he he doesn't kind of go into the space of where a designer gets their inspiration from at all. He stays exactly where he is. I can imagine, almost imagine him still like maybe 15 years old in his bedroom, and he still sees the same things. So he's still using webbing. He's still using all those kind of hyper materials, but that are quite cheap in a way, and still using those bright cottons and stuff. And he doesn't kind of stray away and be like, okay, I'm a designer now. Yeah. He's kind of like, I'm, I'm just me, and I'm working on that level, I'm working with the things that I've seen day to day, and kind of make it, making them kind of more aspirational in a, by just pl plugging these things together. It's quite an interesting I idea, isn't it, actually? Because that means, you know, if you're, just thinking from the sort of commercial aspect, if your brand is so sort of autobiographical, if mm. it's so related to you, and as he grows, because obviously not all designers work like that. Some people almost have like an alter ego, or they just sort yeah. of, you know, a collection is it, like the conceptual thing. It's it's about stories. It's not really about them. And if everything's so tied to you, it would be quite fascinating to see what he does, you know, in like ten years time, and when how? he's like forty or something, yeah. you know, and and whether people stay with him with that or, you know. Yeah, I think he's probably one of the only designers that actually has kind of almost kept doing the same thing, which people maybe have said that's kind of a bad thing, but mm. in general, as maybe an artist rather than a designer, that's actually a good thing. That, that's not true though. No? No, because <laughs> at the beginning he was, uh, you know, he was a milliner. And, that's and he was a very high-end milliner, and, and actually he was right up there with Stephen Jones in terms of skill. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, that's a slight exaggeration, but he looked like he could get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I think is quite interesting is that very rapidly, he sort of re-thought 
and read and reconsidered and instead of you know there are so many people in fashion who are fake posh people because they think that's the way to get ahead yeah. and when I first moved to London I, I sort of kept you know I was in Shoreditch and this weird white private school world and uh, and I was sort of like you know at first I was hiding where I was from and now you know I find it amazingly hilarious to tell people that I only had one toilet in my house and that and you know that I've lived in a council flat isn't yeah, that like, shocking <laughs> do you know what I mean and, 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 and but at the time I didn't want to because I, I felt inadequate and he very quickly realised where his power lay in mm. what he actually loves and I, and Louise Gray has been posting a lot about being yourself. So Did he not used to um, show before her uh, runway shows? Is that how he started? Was wasn't it? So that's how it comes through. Oh, I don't know. I mean, he started doing. But I'm, I'm sure he did. He not design for her as well. He he did. Oh, you're it. absolutely right. He designed for her. He designed for Gareth Pugh. Oh really? I didn't know any of this. Do you put, dress any of your musicians in the same as well? Um, no, they a, a lot of them ask for a lot of the people you were saying, you know, um, Darky Freaka, all those kind of people are friends of mine. I think, you know, Coco Design, all that kind of um, underground hip hop um, inspired uh, designers, they're all kind of into that, but not yet. Obviously, Nazir, you know, the kind of clientele they're going for is ID Magazine, is, you know, Tank, all this more kind of um, editorial stuff, so they're not quite there yet, there yet sorry, but um, I think I think that's exactly what the kind of people he's catering to, because a lot of my friends that, you know, don't work in fashion or maybe are just aspiring musicians or whatever, they don't know about any kind of designers, they don't know about the Christopher Shannons or James Long or anyone, but they know Nazir, mm. specifically for, or like, you know, when he brought out the, was it the Grime? They did like a grime. Yeah, he did with a flavoured sure. Yeah, and I think when when yeah. he did that, I think he like earned a lot of respect from people like that for being like just real. And I think that's why he's kind of got his own following because he's obviously realised very quickly who he is and is comfortable with that. And that's why his customers, way. when they each season are coming back for the same thing, like with the signature hat, like with the pencil, they're always coming back to see what's new and what's like different. Because like obviously the customer don't really get like the whole fashion show and the season thing. They just want to come in and buy it then and there. Yeah. And like when I post it on social media, they think oh it's available. But then when I explain to them in depth like it's the season next season, they're like oh and they're like oh how has it changed? Is the price has changed? The materials and you, you get got, you proper get into a conversation and then they walk away with a bit of more knowledge about the brand itself and then they're like, oh, he's actually like, you know what I mean? Like, they've really thought about it and then customers, because you know, if you're not in fashion, you just walk into a shop and you just buy it. There's no really thought about it, you like it and that's it. But now customers are like, really understanding Nazir and like you say, with the whole reference to the video game, I see it as like, you know, you do it by a video game, you buy the series one and series two. Yeah. Each collection is like the next, the next yeah. game, the next yeah. chapter, and that's what I like about Nazir. And yeah. I feel like I'm involved in that game. I want to be like one of his like heroes in the video <laughs> game. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. There's a kind of, I feel like there's a bit of a culture. I mean, I don't know, maybe when I was younger, there was a bit of a culture which was like that. It was like, okay, there's the Air Force One. What have they done this season? I don't know. What if, colour? Was, what colour yeah. ways have yeah. they done them in? Which tracksuits can you get next? It was kind of like JD Sports, Foot Locker kind of vibe. And that's kind of how I think it feels with him. It feels like you're continuously on this kind of journey of like trying to get the next next best thing. Exactly. It's almost like this kind of showy, kind of almost hyper masculine, like the way he shows it. Why is, um, you know, Nazir considering the groundswell of love amongst the fashion set? and amongst the kids and amongst most people. But still, I was looking at his show reviews. You know, Style.com have never reviewed him. Mm. Uh, Days have only reviewed mm. him once. This, d why? I think he's a real <laughs> underdog. Mm. I think part of it is, you know how when you, um, when you read your IDs and your days and stuff, you learn a lot more about the brand or that you buy into it a lot more when you read about the designer and, who the people they hang about with and you know the places they go to but I think when I was reading up on before I came I um, 
there wasn't much about him at all. And I think what was nice is that the few that spoke about him said he was kind of a bit of he was kind of mysterious and how you said before about how his um the way he went about a collection, you know, twenty four hours before a show, he would kind of think all rules go out the window and um, it's just make what you can with what you've got and that's when he can be most creative. And I kind of thought the fashion industry isn't ready to, this is from my opinion, to admit that, that sometimes that a piece might go out on the runway and there might have not been this inspiration or so much planning going into it. It might have been, been a fluke. I, totally I don't agree, think they're yeah. ready to admit that yet, but with Nazir, yeah. it's just real. I agree, because I don't, I don't know so much about with days, but I think the star.com for sure, like 100%. It's a bit yeah, because I think part of me thought, well, maybe it's because it's still quite early days since he's made the transition from being a min or, you know, or, or a hatter, I guess as he called it, to to having the full collection, so it's a bit early to say. Mm. Maybe they, maybe they're still waiting to see whether they think he's still a one-trick pony in, yeah. in respect, and there isn't going to be an evolution. But fundamentally, I think you're right. I think it's like from a journalist point, journalistic point of view, they're thinking he doesn't come out and say this is an inspiration. This is where I'm being fed from. You know, there's not enough for them to but get. That's their what a visionary into. is. Someone that just I think maybe, doesn't I take too much inspiration from. You know, like when I was looking at some of the collections that went out this season, you know, you can definitely see there's quite a lot of similarities throughout all of them. And I'm not saying Nazir isn't one of them, obviously everyone is kind of influenced by similar things, but I do feel that with him, it's there's something a little bit different about it that he, you know, with the plastic pots on the head, the, the bins. The buckets. Oh, the buckets, and I kind of, I don't get it, and I'm wondering where that's slotted in, but I like it because I just think, you're creating something out of nothing. You're creating something completely different than no one else has done. Like he's seen a bucket on the floor and he's like, just thought, that I'm just going to do that, yeah. yeah. And yeah. that's what I like about him. I also think it, it might be to do with the fact of whether people actually understand the references. Because, you know, speaking to you guys, you're all kind of, if you will, part of that subculture. You know, uh, fr from my point of view, you know, I'm, I'm not massively aware of him, but one thing I immediately like is the fact that anything that supports and celebrates localised subcultures I, I'm all for. I am, I, I am absolutely sick and tired of this kind of homogenisation of culture that's happened th through the internet. You know when I go on Twitter and there's some guy from Huddersfield talking about how he's stalked, I think People from Huddersfield don't speak like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, and, 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 and one thing I, I've always loved about, you know, the UK particularly is the fact that we've always had that twist on things. You know, a, a magazine, and I've said this before, but a magazine like The Face could never have come out of the US. And yet, you know, the US, partly because of hip hop culture as well, seems to be absolutely steamrollering the planet. Do you know what I mean? American celebrities, American music, and and you know, and in the UK, we've always, you know, when hip hop came along, particularly, you know, and probably speaking from before these guys were born, but when hip hop first came along, you know, not long after that, we had rave culture, and from rave culture, there's been all these kind of beat driven subgenres of music that obviously influence fashion so you know whether that be drum and bass uk garage two-step you know grime whatever and, and you know this this designer is clearly you know influenced and a, and a part of that you know and um so you know i i, I think that can be no bad thing you know i, I hate the idea of you know when i travel going to countries and it's just the same high street, the same culture, the same music, every, everywhere you go, do you know what I mean? It's like, I, well, I, I think maybe I'm resisting going, the modern world, but... <laughs> going back to that late 90s show, it, it was a very fake downtown New York, late 90s show, it's early 2000s show, it was a fake downtown New York white people thing. And I, this is gonna sound completely fucking retarded, but I, I'd, I'd come expecting to end up in a Nina Cherry video, you know, <laughs> or, or, on, or on, you know, Rough Guide to the World or something, or on the, you know, that kind of uh, Channel Four kind of idea of eighties London. In a, in, and so I think it's good that people like Nazir have come along who, who are making something real that relates to 
too real because I've, I've spoken to people in Russia and they say the same thing. They say, our hipsters think they live in New York. And you know, and you go around the world and people will say, they'll complain, they'll say, oh, those people just want to be American. And it's, it's, it's dull. Um, I find it I find it dull too, you know. I, I, like I say, I, I just think that there's, you know, there are, reg even like we were saying earlier, there's regional differences in men's fashion in this tiny island, you know, and this tiny island also generates, you know, or historically has generated great music and, you know, all these kind of subcultures that have been adopted and commodified by places like Tokyo or, you know, yeah. and, 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 you know, there's always been that exchange between New York and London, you know, like there's always that thing about punk rock, where did punk rock start? Well, it was, oh, you know, America did it first, but America never did it in any way as stylishly as the Sex Pistols did it with, you know, McLaren and Westwood behind them. Well, they, they never, you know, they never, punk, punk was American, but it wasn't a style. The music was American, but the style was British. And I was speaking to some French people about this, a French fashion editor, she invited me to around to her house for dinner. And they're saying, why, why does London have such great street style? And I said, because we're not allowed to talk. You know, being an intellectual is a dirty word, so we put on amazing outfits. What do you think? Well, I think there's also the thing about punk in the UK had the establishment to push back against. You know, another thing we've got here that they don't have in the US and the US don't really understand is the class system. You know, and what, what punk did was took kind of, um, you know, took symbols like the Union Jack and completely subverted that. And, and represented that in a way, you know, God Save the Queen, all that sort of, you know, all that kind of British iconography that was part of our establishment was completely turned on its head. So, but I'm just using punk as an analogy about how, yes, the Americans started it, but, you know, we did something else with it in the same way that, you know, in, in 1988 in the, in, in the Hacienda, they were playing Chicago house music and we were going to all night warehouse parties. You know, it, it was music that was coming out of America, but we were taking it and doing something with it See, that I the Americans it. weren't doing. You know, the Americans only seem to be getting on to sort of warehouse parties now, do you know what I mean, when we've been doing it for See, I think it, sh it shows that there's kind of a thirst for that again. There's a thirst for what's hidden and having to dig a bit deeper because, you know, as great as social media is, the trouble is that everything can be seen and dissected everywhere all the time and you know when we're talking about you know 80s 90s you know punk everything all these things were things that had to filter down because you couldn't access them it was you know word of mouth and from little pocket to little pocket and i think i mean me personally i certainly feel it you've got an appetite for wanting those things that aren't immediately accessible that everybody can't necessarily get a hold of that a mate tells you about or you find out in a way you know that sort of sense of discovery again and I think maybe it's all linked to that that sort of delving deeper and so when you have someone like him that's showing you something which you inherently feel is a little bit more real there's a lot to be said for that there's a, there's a real allure to that I think well also I wondered because your in Instagram handle is inner city life inner city pressure mm -hmm. and um, you know like obviously the Goldie track and what you were saying earlier about beat driven music I think it's quite interesting because there was a time, you know, the mid 90s were styleless in dance music. And, and actually Nazir and actually a lot of brands, a lot of designers feel like they finally found a way to dress bass music, to style bass music. Mm. Mm. But I Aaron, mean, you're nodding your head. So, so, sorry, Gary. No, go on. You were nodding your head. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Gary. Do any of you guys go raving? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I got an eye on them. Yeah, no. When you go raving, do you see Nazir stuff? Do you see people actually yeah. wearing that? No, because I don't really go to any fashion parties or anything like that. No, but so that's like, what I'm saying, because you're saying the, the, the fashion press are, aren't necessarily. But I think all the elements of Nazir's work are there, but they're not all together. So you do see, you do see pocket bags. Yeah. You do you see, see the webbing. You do see. I don't know, lots of nylon. You do see really cheap cotton on t-shirts and things that are printed. So that's all there, but so what I you're think saying is you see his influences, but you don't actually see his. But you clothes. don't see his clothes, right? Yeah. So I think that's. I don't know whether he's specifically getting inspiration from that whole kind of culture, 
but those things are all there and they're all on that same level of it's almost kind of like, I'd say a low level culture because it's it is a bit of a subculture yeah. in the way even though that kind of doesn't exist at the moment there is a bit of a subculture in bass music with kind of people kind of stealing all the grime grime records like all in Guzu and Guzu and people in New York who are actually really be tapping into all the things that we've already had for such a long time. So I think all those influences are there, but he, what makes him special, I think, to me and uh, uh, all his other fans is that he brings those together in ways that is almost couture in a way, and, and you would never expect to see these designs at London Fashion Week, which is another exciting thing, because yeah. it's, it's like, this is high level, high level fashion. And he's the top. Sort of you know, he's doing exactly. runways. So what I'm curious about now then is <coughs> who his audience are, because if it's not if it's not the kind of kids who are going raving, and it's not being represented in the mainstream fashion media, is it? You know, who who is that audience? Well, the people coming from Nazir for for my selling aspect is like obviously you've got his friends. Nazir is all about his friends. He'd rather have um from talking to him himself, he'd rather see his friends in his gear than mm. a celebrity. Mm -hmm. He's not like, I'll oh, put it on this yeah. celebrity, it's gonna get loads of sales. He's more about, let my friends and close friends around, uh, group around me be in it, and then other people see him in that, and yeah. then they wanna wear it. And they it. wanna support yeah. him. But like from selling it as well, you have his friends, and then you have his like fans from social media, and then you even get like the people who see people in the street and then they just word of mouth and then yeah. they come in and but have you got that hat with the pencil? Have you got that girl's boob tube with the, the logo? And it's just like word of mouth at the time and then they just come in to see what it's about. Yeah. And it's like, it's quite interesting as well because like some days I'll sell to his friend and then some days I'll just tell his complete random person and they don't even know what Nazir is but they just like it the way it looks and it's different and they've never seen anything like it before. Yeah, yeah. I think, <laughs> I think there's a bit of a, a gaze really, I think like, what he makes is yeah it's, it's reference from from this but outside there there's like i think all his most of his like buyers are like Jap japanese i think yeah he's got and a like huge there's a massive in Asia. gaze and they kind of they don't know anything about channel u they don't know anything about grime really but they kind of see it and they're like i want that and it kind of relates to them in a completely different way than it relates to maybe me or one, aaron one or, of the exciting things i've found about it is um uh, I guess you'd sort of call it the art scene, if you if you want, and um, you know because there is a sort of slightly separate. And I, I I get very excited by cool people who aren't fashion people. I love that because I I go to a lot of fashion parties and think that I'm hanging out it's somewhere cool but when you see cool people wearing fashion who aren't fashion people, and a lot of the, those kind of you know I don't know unwashed artists producer types who like hang around on the edges of fashion are wearing it and I find that quite exciting yeah you know you see a lot of caps on those boys yeah them hats do fly out <laughs> yeah um, so I've just been told by the uh, powers that be that um, we can look at some images from the exciting uh, oh, nice <laughs> they were more on a kind of close up vibe I was just cleaning out here. Yeah. There's nothing in from now fashion which might be some reflection on how seriously they treat Nazir. Um, <laughs> yeah. Not for now. Yeah. So I'm sure it wouldn't be late if they were doing Gucci. Well, do you know what, like selling Nazir as well, I've just done a bit confused, you know, I've never understood this and you might be able to help me, but like, mm. what, you know the actual mask? Yeah. I know it's just a showpiece, but I'm trying to think where's... The inspiration? Yeah, that's I the only thing I get confused. I feel like I it, it might be Batman. from... I always see I it in every like shot. I get You know confused. the guys that smell the trainers? And is like, it like, really, is it like, like a the courier thing to stop pollution? <laughs> is it that? Like like Do you know, I actually you know, thought it was like Ben like from Batman, like but I know what you're talking yeah, about. You're about cycle yeah. couriers. Yeah. He's like, you're about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, you're talking no, about the cycle couriers, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, 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 that's what I'm talking about. It looks also like a, because I know what you this mean as well, but it also looks like the BMX helmets. Yeah, that as well. But I was talking about, there's a little kind of almost subculture. I think it's in Russia, where a lot of the kind of, um, gay guys are right like, smelling shoes and trainers because yeah, there's yeah. a fetish. It's about, an oh, fetish. I, I get that. that from it with yeah, the straps and stuff. Kind of what yeah. I'm getting from that whole thing because 
I've seen he made, I think he did use a Jordan or, or something yeah, yeah. and he deconstructed it and put it around oh, the I've face. Seen that, I think yeah. maybe, I don't know if that's where it came and It's from. amazing that I wore one yesterday. It's amazingly comfortable yeah. and you can breathe very easily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're wandering around town with one on. No, no. I just when I, when I was there yesterday, I wore that kind of pink one. There so you on. tried one on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought you were actually gone out in the street in one of those. No, I should have done. <laughs> I, I also want one of those BMX helmets, but they're amazingly expensive. Do you do you sell those in your shop? No, that's the thing. I don't think that I don't think a lot of buyers buy into it. I think it's from your aspect. It's more of an editorial thing. It's yeah. more of a story. It's like mm. a unique thing to have in a story. Like. I don't think people would walk around the street in it, personally, like, like the Japan, hands. Japan, Japan maybe. Yeah, yeah. Japan, you, I think. They could, in a music video and stuff like that, totally, but personally, me, I wouldn't. You won't like go, go back to your estate with one I wouldn't go back home to my mum's in that, no. I would definitely, <laughs> I get looked at as enough as it is, because that is like, <laughs> who am I trying to be? But I get the whole, like, I like the whole look as one, but personally on its own, I, I personally wouldn't wear it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't wear it, but. But I guess um, so. It's kind of like street work, a chore. Yeah. yeah, that's that's probably what I I wouldn't want to brand him as that, but that's kind of in my head. That's exactly yeah. what he feels so like, like. But this is the show, and you do kind of want to have. You do have show pieces in there, which like stand out, like. And you do bear in mind his background. You do kind of want those touches, the touches of the sort of millinery creativity, the yeah. sort of, you know talking about because I think when he was doing the stuff for Gareth. It was generally the masks. It was the stuff that was a bit more yeah. hardcore in that respect. So it's quite actually quite nice to see it coming back a little bit. So because it makes it a bit less literal as well. Well, it's me. also where he feels cyber. You know, for Gar Gareth, he he felt Gareth used to have more and still does have that relationship to cyber. And I think what he was doing was quite cyber. And I think you know, for Nazir, he's he's got that. Which for me makes yeah. it a lot more interesting because I think where he would go wrong if he was going to go wrong is when everything just becomes so literal and it's literally almost like when someone goes and they sort of almost take a snapshot of a subculture and then just put it on the catwalk and actually all of a sudden actually there's something a bit sort of a bit grim about that a bit mm. disturbing do you know what i mean it's actually a, it's kind of rip off culture in a way so it's much more exciting for me when you actually see all his more random references the stuff that that are much harder to spot that, that are there you don't know what they mean and I'd love to hear him talking about it so so Kurtley because you uh, actually have seen the show uh, we'd love you to talk us through <laughs> yeah. oh, would you yeah. <laughs> we'd um, love you to talk us through the show alright well I'll start with what you said about cyber and all the shoes were these big I don't know it's what you call those no they're like called the Chunky um, kind of zoo yorks or or because because they like, told me yesterday like, punk slash steampunkish kind of vibe I don't know yeah, kind of yeah they're like, like cyber dog sort of thing. Like you get oh, the sort of metal <laughs> yeah very Cam Camden man <laughs> yeah you know, it's, 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 very very it's funny though because the new the Nico Panda store in New York I mean that was apparently completely um, inspired by um, by cyber dog the cyber store dog, yeah. cyber dog yeah yeah. Um, Oh, he God. also had the <laughs> one thing that really stood out to me, which was this two-piece. Sorry, the shoes are called New Rocks. New, New Rocks. Rock. Okay, cool. Carry um, on. The, the thing that stood out to me was this two-piece green kind of... It felt a bit like a mix between a tracksuit and a suit. Did you see that? I, I know what you're talking about. It's like the blazer the blazer yeah, and the trousers. Right, but it, that for me, I don't know, like that just straight away pinged a reference of kind of like real dancehall culture. And um, they always love to wear a two piece. And it the material was like this kind of, I don't know, I don't know what it was, but it was like green. It was like really silk. It looks si silky. From the image I've seen, it looked like silky. Yeah, exactly. And I think as well, like. Oh, that was with a show pick. Yeah, this is from the show, but like with the his collections as well, like spring, summer, 14 coming in stores now, um, as much as just like the track suits and like the. The more comfortable wearing clothes, he's started to introducing more tailoring like shirts. A bit more formal. Yeah, so it's yeah. like maybe I felt like that in the spring summer is an introduction to what to or, 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 or to what it was going to be, and I think I'm starting to see it now. Like you can see on the, the model with the shirt there, because usually it would just be a t-shirt or a jumper. Yeah. Kazuki did um, a single-breasted um, suit that was, but it was made out of a, a pinstripe. Yeah. It's like polyester tracksuit fabric quite a few wow. years ago that was inspired by the who, kind who, of sorry? Kazuki Kazuki Koreshi he's a guy who he used to design for bathing ape and he does a lot of stuff with neighborhood and a brand called Kashka but he does a lot of stuff with Adidas as well and he he, he kind of took tracksuit fabric that did like a single-breasted suit in that 
which was inspired by the kind of business people in Tokyo where they kind of all wear the suits but he wanted to do something that was kept that look but gave you the comfort that you get from kind of sportswear fabrics. Wow. So um, Kirtley, if you could just talk us, just keep us going through these yeah. pictures. Um, okay, cool. So he had that uh, red check design. Love that. That came in, I think, a, another it's two pieces as well. Wool, Italian cashmere wool mix. Yeah. And like, I think there I start to see like elements of something that's a bit more higher culture artist with the kind of a bit more luxury. That's what I mean. A bit more luxury, m still mixed with the kind of piping and still the cheap ish kind of sportswear references. Um, let's see any other things. He's a lot more pink than I think I've ever seen, except for maybe he did like one looking pink two seasons yeah, there was a, he did two tone. But there was a lot more pink this season. There was a mad two tone metallic pearlescent lurex that in blue and pink, right? Yeah. You, could, you could either get it in blue and sort of silver or pink and silver. Pink, it was, it yeah. was beautiful. And that was amazing. I like where he does that kind of obviously baby pink I remember a time when baby pink was a thing uh, I don't know maybe in the kind of uh, my culture it was kind of a, a thing where loads of people used to wear pink shirts and like that was kind of almost a, a thing to show your masculinity if yeah. you could wear a pink shirt you could rock it to a club or or a bar or somewhere then that was kind of like you saying yeah I'm I'm the guy kind of yeah, thing I so know. hardcore enough to wear a baby exactly. pink shirt yeah so I just see those yeah. things and like, for me, it kind of just pings those references. But it um, always has a strong colour palette all the time. Like, always. It's never bland. It's like, that's what I love about it. Like each yeah. item is just... It doesn't it's really like, do shy. It's funny, yeah, I think. it's always <laughs> out there. Like everything's just an eye catching. Even if it's like one colour, the fabric or materials used, it just like makes you just want to have it. Well, for my I say it's funny how things go in cycles, as you were saying that about pink, because that was like a football <laughs> terrace thing in like 1983 you know it's like yeah. where you had pretty hard-faced working class youths working wearing this color that was notoriously the most fe feminine color you could wear but it's funny how like you know generations later yeah. that yeah. same yeah. mindset yeah. kind of repeats itself yeah well i remember it being proposed sorry to sound so fashion but i remember it being proposed in the early 2000s and that was exactly the justification that people were saying we were saying people have forgotten that pink used to be like a really laddie thing. Yeah. Like if I wore pink to school when it was like mufti, that's what we used to call it when you used to wear like mufti. Day, yeah. Mufti is like a day when on a, you take a pee, <laughs> and then you know uniform day. Yeah, well, you're you're on day. school you have your uniform and you go <laughs> to on that's Friday you cool. pay fifty p and you get to own your own style <laughs> and. I obviously like my clothing, so if I wore like a pink jumper, I used to always get the mick took out of me, if you get me, but I knew I was comfortable in it, I knew from what I was doing, but like all the guys then, like two years later, were starting to wear like pink, and it was kind of like, now you're shushing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, yeah. The badge is the, yeah. the pink badge of honour. Yeah, I remember yeah. having a pink crew neck Cap a sweater. Nice. <laughs> Bring it. Up. Yeah, <laughs> pink cap. Oh so, Soki, Soki um, give us some of your thoughts. We haven't heard from you for a while. I just, when I'm looking at this collection, I sort of think, was it only like two, three seasons ago when his year kind of was just accessories? Is that yeah, not so long. So, he's fairly yeah. new in, into menswear. Yeah. And I kind of think like it's just growing. It's like, you know, when, when you look through all the other kind of menswear designers that have shown, you know, he is next to, you know, uh, Alexander McQueen and James Long, and these are all m way more established designers, and I just think he's doing really well for himself. So I think this season, obviously, from what I can see so far, I love it already. I think it's a massive step up from last season. Um, much more luxury. Um, I wouldn't say much more wearable, but there's... Um, more distinct look from it. Um, but I'm just like looking forward to see like each season that goes by what he's gonna I eventually think, yeah. produce. Because I think if you look at this this shot, this feels like kind of my, sort of traditional him. If you you know if you yeah. can use a term like mm. that. Whereas the shot before is is there's such a diversity that all of a sudden you can actually see him starting to kind of reach people that possibly would never have ever thought of wearing his like stuff before. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The cyberpunk boots do make me nervous, so I've got to Buffalo, say, si cyberpunk yeah. as a reference, you know, anybody who works in the fashion industry, please stop it, don't <laughs> do it. Yeah. It's like, you know, the way 
you know, you've seen goth be sort of integrated as a huge influence in fashion on, on lots of different levels over this last couple of years. Even, you know, your, your urban kids now have got this kind of take on goth where it's kind of, you know, this sort of hip hop goth, goth thing. Yeah. Goth. And it's like, you know, but cyberpunk, please. It's like, I'll, oh God, I feel it's like, like he the, hits a certain, yeah. like, I think it's a generation thing as well. Like, you know, if you kind of grew up, I think he said in one of his interviews that it was um, men's wear and women's wear was um, definitely boyfriend and girlfriend. And he kind of grew up with the, one was P Diddy and one was Little Kim, was it? Yeah. And that was his yeah. kind yeah. of- It was Biggie and Little Biggie, Kim. Biggie and Little Kim. And that was like his Me inspiration. Life. And I think it's that when I'm looking at that, I kind of can see that already. And he's got his little cult following of, you know, like in London, there's a load of, misunderstood, you know, like you don't understand, you know, people don't understand what I'm wearing, they get a lot of slack for it. And he's kind of making it okay for those people that are a bit, you know, I hate, what's what? the better word for it? Different, you know, like to express themselves in their clothing, to make it cool to do that. Mm. So it's like a little kind of clique. Mm. What was the Keith Haring thing <coughs> I just saw a second ago? Did he, has he done something with Keith No, Haring? that was, um, then three people actually my friends and they're actually buyers and they're from a store, and that's one of the other brands they ah, right, stock. Okay. <laughs> I think. But this is one this of the guy. buyers. He's um, a massive <laughs> fan of, yeah, these are my friends. <laughs> I think what you're saying about kind of making it okay for different people, I think it's actually quite contemporary what he's doing with the steampunk kind of, uh, I can't remember what you call those shows, shoes. Zoo Yorks. Zoo Yorks. Because actually, what we're seeing now, like no, I think I made that up. Sorry, New Rocks. New Rocks. <laughs> <laughs> they got New Rocks. Just make it up. <laughs> We've made a new show. Yeah. Yeah. Zoo York was like Zoo Yorks. U2 album or some shit. Really? I can't remember. Set up a micro trend. <laughs> Short before was really interesting actually. There's almost like elements of the sorry the one just before that yeah. There's almost like elements where she wore, like ripped jeans. It's actually reminding me of like Michael Jackson Thriller. A little bit, even. Really? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I do, when what I it did see the rip thing. Yeah. <laughs> what it reminds me of this collection a little bit is those really mental Turkish clothes shops that you get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You know, that were quite really layers and layers yeah. and yeah. like you know of uh, detail and, and embellishment and a. Uh, you know. Whatever my personal opinions on cyberpunk are, they actually the footwear does work with the way it's been put together, the way it's yeah. been styled. And I like the model cast as well, like each season, he always has like such a strong selection of models and like the guys who actually are modeling for him, you wouldn't normally see wearing his stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's for me as well, if I wasn't in fashion and I seen this guy wearing it, it made me think, oh, you know what, if he can pull that off, I can. Yeah. And that's what I like, all the models are like unique and different backgrounds and, because you know some castings are always like samey. This one is, I think, it approaches different backgrounds and like ethnic, oh, ethnic backgrounds and stuff like mm. that. I love that shot where there was a big gang of them all together. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, like a, it's like it's like a unit, and that's what yeah. I said about like his like tribe. I call it like the Nazir tribe, and that's what I mean. As much as there's like that tribe for the show, because that's what they're representing Nazir. I'd love to see like the formation of like all the different tribes of like different groups. Like there's like my group of friends and there's like his fans and there's like all like, you know, like your group yeah. of friends and yours, if they were Nazir, like all come as one. Yeah. Well, like as I was saying to Gary bef before we uh, started, um, you know, he's a great art director. It's a great fantasy space. Yeah. He's a great fantasy tribe. It's good. You know, it's a place you want to go. It's a place you want to go and exist and hang out and you want to be with those people because cool. they look, they look like, you know, they, they're, they're dealing with not, you know, they're not getting, I don't know, it's not boring. And no, it's not, exactly. Uh, <laughs> escapism. Yeah, it's does, escapism. Yeah, he yeah. style, does he style it as well? No, um, and Matthew, Joseph, Matthew Joseph styles it for oh, okay. him. They always work together like. It's really good. Them. It, yeah. Really good. But what does Anna do women's? Um, Anna does the women's one, yeah. Right, right. So, I mean, he's working with two of the most exciting stylists yeah. in London and right up now. and coming, like. Yeah. Of the sort of young generation. Um, so. <clears throat> I think it also makes it okay for a straight man to wear this kind of clothing. This is what I'm saying. You know, like, especially when you tap into the whole music thing, I think that's why now it's okay for, you know, the likes of ASAP Rocky or Kanye West to wear these kind of 
things because like five years ago you wouldn't see yeah. that market like wearing anything like this now that they these are what they want to yeah. wear yeah and that's why you yeah. when you go, when i've been to the show you can see like their stylist there and they're like taking notes yeah. and then soon you start seeing inspirations in the next video and yeah that, that's the thing with these artists is they want to be wearing that next hot thing and like they just want i know that stylists are there tonight and they're like yeah that's that, a that, show and well, they just I, want it i've got a theory on this in that it's not necessarily you know um that i think it's been led by the viewer and i think to an extent, style has become a hell of a lot more important. Like there was an article on Complex, and we had the editor, of, uh, fashion editor of Complex magazine on here Matthew yesterday. Matthew Henson, yeah. And and there was an article in Complex talking about Tumblr hip hop, and how people think that they're into certain artists because they've seen it on the internet and they've read all about it and they know everything about it. And I I'm very guilty of that. And I think people are experiencing things on a level of style, and because the internet is so image led now. People are getting into things just because of style. Whereas mm -hmm. at one point, people would have got into things uh, through a more cerebral intellectual process or through friends. Now they're going, that matches my <coughs> Tumblr or that matches my Instagram and I'll be into that. You get it a lot with the art world with sort of musicians that are only famous amongst artists or musicians that are only famous amongst fashion people. So I think, um, and I think this is special to London because uh, because London has always been arranged like this. London fashion has always been about style, about lifestyle, about music style. I don't know, what do you guys think about this? Sorry for that like overlong rant. <laughs> I think that a lot of, um, this is only from my opinion, when I speak to friends that work in fashion or in music or any of the arts, that a lot of the ones that, you know, dress in something completely different or they've got their own style, that other people might not understand, there's a massive sense of insecurity and I think that clothing gives them that extra kind of, what's the word for it, like a bit more of meaning to them. Mm. And I mean, I'm, maybe I shouldn't admit this, but I'm like a prime example of that as well. You know, everyone can be as confident as you want to be, but it's your security blanket. And I think with a lot of musicians, there's coming like, to enter that place to write your own music or whatever, you have to get to a certain place to be able to write about your experiences and how you feel. And I think like style obviously kind of is a huge part of that. Does that make sense? Beautiful. I'm terrible at explaining things, but I know what I mean in my head. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's kind of like, that's only from my perception because I talk to a lot of people about things like that, but um, that's what I get. Curtly. Yeah. That was great. <laughs> I love that. That took, <laughs> I, yeah. I, that took me on a trip to a place. Yeah, I was just like, I don't live in reality <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's my presentation. That was great. And, and so, you know, because you dress musicians, it was lucid. Yeah, because I, I get to see a bit of both. You know, I, I go on an editorial and I, I, you know, I'll be working with a male model who'll look at this and be like, oh, this is amazing. This is, this is sick. You know, they're, they're trying new things every day. There's nothing that will scare them. And you take, you know, a pair of those trousers onto music video or press shots or whatever with the musicians. And the fact that he's got his top out is a massive deal. And it's, you see them at their most vulnerable and you can tell, and I always analyze like what their perception and what they're like around that. And it's just so, it's so obvious to see. Wow. I'm, I'm the same. Um, <laughs> I think <coughs> like, I guess from like a younger generation kind of thing where as you said, like we're so visually led and we've got like our iPhones and we've got like Instagram, Tumblr and everything that we just draw like for like. So it's like similes, everything. If, if you find something that looks somewhat similar, then it, it might work for you and you, you feel like you've got that connection to it. So you see, I don't know, with him, you see, I see, I see uh, webbing and I'm like, oh my days, my, my uh, Just Do It bag from back in the day. And I'm like, straight away, that's that's something that I can grab onto. So you're obsessed with webbing? Yeah, I was going to say that I as said well. that about a million no, no, times. That's something that I can really... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, caught, you caught me on that one. <laughs> like, no, 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 <laughs> but that's something that he uses, like, as you've got it on now, you've got it there, you've got it on Oh, your, this material, like, on backpacks and stuff. Yeah. Because I was like, webbing, I was like, what, what's what? It's your comfort blanket. <laughs> webbing is your comfort blanket. Literally. Um, and I don't know, it just has such a specific reference to a time, personally, maybe just personally for me, of a time where, like, where it was like early secondary school, 
and everybody used to wear the those. Nike those, one. The Nike ones, yes, you know? Yeah, the drawstring. And that was your main, main problem in life, the, about what you were going to wear. And it was what you were going to wear. Yeah. Which, which, just do it bag, were you going to wear? Which colour were you going to have? And what was it <laughs> going to say okay, about you? Yeah, you know, those kind of things. Do you remember like, the JD bags? Yeah. <laughs> the JD <laughs> bags. Shelly, Shelly exactly. bags. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, girls had yeah Shelley's <laughs> bags to school. I do think, um, with just going back to the, the sort of Tumblr thing and the Instagram thing, particularly Tumblr, I think, you know, it's definitely a generation now where, compared to when I was young, you know, you tend to be a bit more tribal about what you wanted, whereas now it's a bit more schizophrenic, but not necessarily in a bad way. But I think, you know, because the way even people buy music and the way they listen to music, if you're buying, you know, listening to music on iPod, literally you can be one track and another track, whereas before it would have to be full albums. Mm -hmm. So you, and that's why you'd kind of be full albums, you sort of take looks more wholesale. Where now what you're seeing, and I think especially with this collection that's really nice about it, you're seeing all those sort of hybrid influences and it's, you know, mixing it up and making it okay to sort of like things from different genres. And it, it, that, that's quite a different way of thinking, I think maybe mm. from the last couple of years, possibly. Mm. It's and interesting. I think as well from like social media as well is like um, for like it's depending on your following as well. Like a lot of my people I follow obviously supporting us here, but it's like even if I wasn't involved in fashion and then my still my friends and whatever, you, you kind of like get into that whole world and you're like you're seeing it and you like you feel like you need to be part of it and then like like yeah. say like you like something and I follow you and I, like, I admire your work and then I like my whoever follows me likes it and it's like immediately it's like a whole. Yeah, before you know it's like spreading and I think that's with Nazir as well like he's got such a like cool basis in London and that's how it's branched over to like different parts of the world and like Asia especially like that's why like so many people over there buy a full look well one of yeah. one of the most absolutely beautiful things that fashion can do I think and uh, you were talking about uh, you know s s punk and the Sex Pistols and, and Malcolm McLaren tried to do this and I think Nazir's done this and Carrie, cassette player, definitely tried to do this. You literally give shape and form to ideas. By, by making clothes, you literally take an idea, take an intellectual construct, and you give shape and form to it, and so it can be broadcast throughout the world. Yeah. So people can yeah. see an idea. Uh, what, an what, identity. Yeah. You're basically using fashion to fuel this identity and kind of flesh it out and, yeah, totally because because they're, they're kind of together I think that's the thing because I always feel like when it works brilliantly with music so I you'll probably have loads more on this but um, is when you see them and you feel like they're kind of working in tandem rather than you know you've got someone and they've just been styled and it's really got kind of nothing to do with them and you can see it's just a record company mm -hmm. whereas when you get you know a stylist and artist working together and you feel like that person's vision and their identity has really been kind of propelled through fashion in a way that maybe they couldn't do alone yeah. and you see that evolution I think that's really yeah it's really exciting it's really it's quite magical when that happens yeah. Gary it's interesting because it's 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 <coughs> you know the stuff you guys are talking about is very different to how things were when I was younger because if you were wearing certain brands and certain looks <coughs> you understood what you were referencing you will you, you you like when you're saying like well we'll take a bit of that and we'll take a bit of that and we'll mix it all up you know i'm sure that when i see you know some of these kind of kids who are into hip-hop and they're wearing goth styling if you were to ask them who the cure are or who bauhaus were they'd have absolutely mm. no idea of what mm. it is that they're actually referencing it's yep. just mm -hmm. it's a look that they've seen online and it's like oh that looks fun i'm going to put some studs in a leather jacket and you know it's it's like the thing of on, on a on another um level like people wearing ramones t-shirts who've never yeah. owned a ramones album do you know what i mean it's mm. like that's how things are yeah. now where when i was younger if you were going to wear a band on a t-shirt you'd you'd want to know that you knew something about that band do you what, know what was I mean? that about because i used to I used to find that terrifying. I used to see sort of guys like you, uh, Craig Ford, a mate of his, I can't remember his name, and I used to think, I'd love to talk to them, but I'm terrified because my references won't be in order. <laughs> and it was sort of 20 years. <laughs> Not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> there was sort of 20 years of culture where having your references in order, you know, like the, the casual thing is very full of... Um, writers who are borderline angry psychopaths who like you know who would like uh, get very upset about people not understanding 
who'd won what first and that kind oh, of thing. I mean, I get it all the time. People all say, to, you know, cause people like, oh, you know, I did um, an exhibition last summer of my trainers <coughs> and I was, I did an interview and I was talking about how I'd been wearing trainers since the 1970s. Now, I've got innumerable photographs of myself in the late 70s on holiday in Spain with my mum and dad wearing Adidas kick and Adidas t-shirts that my mum bought the t-shirts from the catalogue and bought the trainers from my local sports shop but it's like all of a sudden it's like who's he think he is you know like no way he's been into it since the 70s and it's like <laughs> well I didn't say I was it been into it since the 70s I said I started wearing Adidas in the 70s but I guess growing up in um you know, in the northwest, in a, a working class environment, it was it was very important what you were wearing because if you got that wrong, you were going to get chastised. You were going to, you know, you were going to get beaten up. You were yeah. going to get your dinner money taken off you. You know, you, you were talking about it earlier it's growing like on up on a council estate. estate. If you wasn't wearing the right thing or like the it train at the time or whatever, you would get scrutinised for it. It becomes part of your kind of armour. It becomes part of your sort of like, you know. I'm wearing this, therefore I'm one of you, therefore I'm okay. You are kind of pledging allegiance really, aren't you? Yeah, and, and some of this stuff that we are talking about, you can get away with in London, you, because London is this melting pot, you know, you can come to London and completely reinvent yourself if, that, if you so choose to do that, and you'll be completely fine, but you know, you've got to, <laughs> you've got to Burnley dress like that, and you're not going to get out of the place alive, you know, so it's... I guess it's, 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 there, there's definitely a generational difference in what has happened as a result of, you know, I, I've observed it go from, you know, because when I grew up, I didn't look at fashion magazines. It was just, I saw what kids were wearing in the local youth club or the football match or the local disco or whatever. And that's where I, you know, I took my lead from that. And then in the 90s, I started to sort of look at fashion. I looked at the old magazine in the late 80s, like Arena, but the 90s I started to sort of look at magazines a bit more but I've watched it go working in the industry I remember when it was all about magazines and the change that has come as a result of social media yeah because this is symptomatic of that isn't it that's that's symptomatic of people and, and just like you said you know it, it's the visual thing as well it's almost like surf you know surfing the surface layer rather yeah. than kind of getting into it. I don't think that many people do read. Because you, you, you've got these, you know, you've got these, you've got these yeah. kids making yeah, music who are, n who are not <laughs> kind of necessarily kind of, you know, household name, chart topping artists. And then you, you look on their Twitter and it's like 250,000 followers and you're like, where did they come from? Do you know what I mean? But it's, it, it's different now in the respect that, you know, I, I mean, I can see a lot of parallels between grime and when I listen to electro music. When I listen to electro music and we used to go to spinning and buy imported 12 inches and there were Street Sounds albums, me and all my peer group was listening to that music, but you never heard any of that music in the charts. That's, but we were all into that growing up. And I think you've, you've got that happening now on another level, you know, it's, it, but, you know, these guys are using social media and the likes to... Well, to promote themselves amongst their people, you know. There's like mad levels of internet fame, isn't there? So yeah. You, yeah. you have people, like you said, who are huge. Uh, I thought it was quite funny because there's that Kendrick Lamar line about, um, you know, and the, the song where he says he's the biggest rapper and he's like, your Instagram can eat my nuts. But like that is true. There are the rappers yeah. that have, have five hundred thousand Instagram but it's like followers. It's like J2K. He, he did, he's done the prep protect. It's a trainer protector. And then he speaks to Wiley and he speaks to, you know, the rest of the sort of boy better know a lot. And they all go on their sort of, you, you know, they all go on their social media. And it's like his crep protect goes into JD Sports and sells out in a couple of hours because all those kids that sort of follow him, it's sort of, there's like a sort of like pledging allegiance to their own and wanting to support their own. So that hoary style mag cliche of 10 years ago that there's no underground anymore is bollocks. It's just it's changed form. I think it's just changed form. It's it's kind of it's fragmented, and it's not in the way where you have these big, you know, statement youth cultures that become reference points. It's like it it's like it, and it changes a lot quicker now. I think. Anybody else got an opinion on that? I think the there is still underground because you 
if you put five people into a room they're going to do something and it's not going to be known for a sec but until you put it on Instagram mm. it's just that the underground can be found out in an instant now I think maybe but and people are ignoring it now mm, ignoring Nazir well no or, they're just like like we were talking about these people that have hundreds of thousands of followers that never make it into the mainstream oh you mean yeah um, some of them don't want to either that's the other thing it, it, it's meaningless to them it's outside of their frame of reference they don't care you know why well like Nazir care. doesn't want a pop but star it's such a super, we live yeah. in such a superficial like generation at the moment and you know you can see that on Instagram you know yeah. there are people that I see and I worship their work you know um, I don't I can't name any names but you know you've got I've got my Instagram for example and I will post a picture of my blue ponytail and I'll get 500 people being like, oh my God, I love you. And I'll post a picture of a shoot that I've spent, you know, three days prepping for. That I'm so, the proudest thing I've ever done in my life. And no one really cares. And, uh, and they I buy into what they, what they want to, what they think is cool. And it's it's just, true. That, I think that I, is how. It's fickle and it's, it's random yeah. and it's got it's, no real it's, depth it's, to it's it. It's really weird for me as well. Like same with you, like you said about your blue hair. If I do like a, t like a fashion picture and I get loads of likes and loads of comments, like where did you get that from? And I do a nice picture with me and my best friend and then I get no likes and you're and it's just like my friends like it's like they just want <laughs> it's really weird how social media works these days and I only want my followers only want me and they don't want no one else if I post a picture with you <coughs> no no like say I Instagram say I Instagram if I Instagram this picture now people will probably like it, a few people will like it but then like no one will give like the real attention what i want it to be given like you said about your work and it's like kind of like but it's it's also like if i <coughs> post a picture of something nazar nazar nazir's done um you know it'll get so many likes if i posted something that had the name Vogue connected to it. I'd get millions yeah. of likes and the image could actually not be but very good. This is gonna sound like really bad as well, like with social media, as much as I've been going to some shows, I haven't posted any pictures of the shows on my social uh, media. It sounds really bad, but because I know that they're not, it's not gonna get the likes what I want it to get. So I just like post myself in the actual clothing and then it sounds really bad, but yeah. that's what I do because I know that that's what my family want to see. If I post like, for example, this catwalk picture, it will get a few likes, but I'll be embarrassed to like at Nazir and then he'll be seeing, uh, that's what I feel. And I feel like an insecure, I get insecure about myself. Mm. And that's, like, that's weird what, how you're censoring yourself. Yeah, I know. And all my friends censor it, but I'm, I'm involved in this now. It's like, I see Instagram as like, it's my addiction now. Mm. And I think a lot of people can admit to that. Yeah. Like, especially yeah. for the younger generation, the older generation who get into social media now, I'm like, whatever. But with me, I take it, I, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? But I do take it really seriously. I really do. I, I think the idea of underground as well, you have to put that in the context of what you're saying underground is. You know, if you're talking about something that's underground in the 90s, versus yeah. something that's underground now. The context of underground, you know, that that yeah. that is completely different. It's completely different, you know, because you're playing by a completely different set of rules now. You know, it's not as it's not as dependent on, you know, like a fashion magazine to sort of be the you know, the pervading opinion that everybody's gonna follow, you know, and like I say it's it's become much more fragmented. So before we close, I have some questions from the audience, um, which just is always like a mega cheesy, <coughs> mega fromage moment. This is a bit ready, yeah. Jake. Can you please close your legs? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Isabella, Isabella Hines at the Style Civ. <coughs> I wonder what that means. Um, what is one of the most important pieces of advice you would give to someone trying to start their own label? Just believe in yourself. <laughs> if you don't go to university, I would say university because you've got to learn. There's skills, basic skills that you need to learn. How to put together a collection, how to get inspiration, how to you know pattern cutting, everything around that. But if not, like experience, you know, like working with a designer that you would see yourself having a career. You know, for me, for example. Vivian Westwood or Pam Hogg, you know, they're kind of inspirations of mine. So if I wanted to design something along those lines, I would go and work with them and learn a bit about them. Yeah. Okay, I'm um, sorry. Just, I think these, this is going to sound really crazy, but I think these questions aren't actually relevant to Nazir. And somebody said to me that, uh, that, that when they're listening to these, they can 
be a bit long and so I don't I think I'll let them we'll talk about general questions another time so what are your closing thoughts on Nazir that's all I can see I love it I'd say really mm. impressed that it seems to be evolving and it looks like there's real legs <coughs> I say I actually think after talking about this I actually think there's he's started to add more and more and more different references which I think is very contemporary and I think that that is like a good way for him to keep going. I personally feel as well from doing this panel, I feel like I've walked, as much as I sell the clothing, I've learnt from all the different opinions. I understand the collection, the collection and the collections before a little bit more, especially with like the backgrounds and I think like now when I'm selling it, I'll be able to do it more 100%. Like it's good for me to have done this. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gary? I just really, really hope he maintains this London-centric identity and doesn't start kind of aspiring to be from somewhere else, that he can kind of stick to that, you know. Whatever my opinions on the aesthetics of it are or whether I like the boots or not, like I said at the beginning, I, I, I love the fact that it's, it's very UK-centric and particularly London-centric. On that very quickly, I'd just like to say I hope he doesn't get gobbled up by a mega brand too early. Oh, a I mega see, brand yeah. that wants to buy into that kind of street style and that attitude and sort of um, take his own very unique perspective off track. And, and so that's your closing thought? Yeah. What about your opinion? I thought we've had enough of those. Really? <laughs> your closing um, opinion? <laughs> Um, my my opinion is that you'd make a very good Nazir Mazar women's wear model. Yeah, definitely. I think I did bake that after a couple too champagne too many champagnes. So I'm apologising <laughs> at Ashford's uh, discussion. No, you definitely yeah. are a Nazir woman. Right. Well, I, I we'll think see that, you next I think the lady from Style Civ, if you want some advice, you go and work at an independent fashion label before even <coughs> dreaming of setting one up because they might understand the realities of it. I, I went to fashion college and I saw all those kids whose mums and dads were going to finance them to become fashion designers. And it's like, you know, you need to understand the reality of what it is you're trying to take on there before you even, you know, it's, it, it's a far cry from kind of standing around stroking your chin like Yves Saint Laurent, you know, when you're dealing with, you know, production and factories and all that kind of stuff. Cool. All right, so general, we love, I love it. Yeah. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.